Welcome back to the Trade Hacker Mindset Podcast. In today's episode, we got a special guest. Mark Anderson is with us. Trading the markets can be difficult to master and seemingly just out of reach. Professional traders have a secret. Trading requires total mental and emotional control. It requires the Trade Hacker Mindset. All right, Mark, what's going on, my friend? How are you? Uh, fantastic. Just another beautiful day in the market. I'm glad we have uh, more Mondays after the holiday, uh, holiday season. And also just kind of preface this, I'm talking about personal trading, not in direct relation to my fund. I'm not a financial advisor, so anything I say shouldn't be taken as investment advice and all legal mumbo jumbo. But aside from that, definitely excited to dive into more about you and everything and just specifically about myself as I'm predominantly a zero DT trader, um, running a hedge fund with that and also trading retail accounts on the side. Started as a basically construction worker picking up on zero DT in 2020 and have had 17 consecutive quarters of profitability in my personal account and just been clicking along with that. I also, you know, am really into some certain aspects of how I identify the trading and shorter duration options as well. Awesome. Well, that's good stuff. And and you know, so you've been you've been in our in the navigation trading community for probably what five, six months? Is that about yeah, right? five to six months? I stumbled upon you guys a while back. I'm basically on every Discord kind of across the zero DT community. And you know, the main thing with getting good at trading, the way I look at it. Is if anyone played sports, it's basically you doing back testing as practice, you deploying set strategies and what size is basically playing time, and then your results are obviously the scoreboard and the win loss. Love it. Yeah, I'm a big. I love. I love the sports analogies because there's so many parallels to trading. Yeah. Uh, let's do this before we before we jump into kind of your trading journey and and some of the stuff that you're doing. Real quick, fun fact about something else that you're involved in is you are a Tony Robbins coach. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, I actually went to a Tony Robbins event probably like four years ago with a sales team. And, you know, they basically described it to me like self-development Coachella. I went to it. Um, we like drank the whole time. And, but I was like, ah, oh, this guy's kind of got probably some stuff to him. So then I ended up uh, coming back and getting more into it. As I did that, I kind of realized that, you know, I was thinking about doing things, I make a decision, and then life would, life would force me to do it. Then I'd go back to Tony Robbins event next year, like, okay, I'm actually going to do it. And then I'd follow through and actually achieve it. And then I was like, hmm, why am I waiting so much time in between all this stuff? I can make all these decisions without a crisis in my life and follow through with that type of uh, fortitude. Then I signed up to do this platinum partnership, which is like, four or five countries a week, every month, probably like 1500 hours of like, kind of like deep self-development stuff. And after I got more into that, you know, the secret to living is giving. So I got back into basically helping people with that and trying to have an impact on how it changed my life. And then next week I'll be doing um, one of my coaching and captaining for kids between 14 and 16 that may not be in the best areas of their life. We're going to go through like a five-day process and event, and then the kids are actually going to vote a couple of people from the team to have a scholarship to go in person to San Diego to do their Global Youth Summit. So that's like the main thing um, I'm interested in now and still got a few more parts for the coaching and training until I get to that, but also love to talk about that as well. Yeah, that that's amazing. You know, I think Tony Robbins has gotten, he's been around for so long and he's gotten so big that I think a lot of people who have not, actually really delved into the details of what he does or been to one of his events, you know, they, they kind of have just a kind of stereotypical, uh, you know, the, the stereotypical motivational speaker type, you know, thought around him, but man, the guy has been so successful for so long. And, and I, and I was one of those people, you know, I was just kind of, you know, when somebody would say something, you know, that was intended to be motivational and be, it'd be one of those things like, Oh, what are you Tony Robbins now? You know, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But then I went to an event and man, it is, it is crazy. It's not, you know, it's, it's definitely not one of those things where you're just sitting there 
and you're hearing, you know, motivational talks, I mean, you are jumping around and moving around and all kinds of crazy stuff. And, and so it's, uh, it's pretty powerful. And there's, there's a reason he's gotten so big and there's a reason that he's, he's been so successful. So uh, that's cool, man. So yeah, you said there was something else you wanted to kind of dive into on that. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of nuts. Like they'll have you walk on fire. Um, you know, we had, it's very holistic. We had a 11 relationships event, a business, you know, event, a spirituality event, science of success, art of fulfillment. And in person, they do go pretty, uh, hard on it. Like remember a date with destiny, it was like seven days and we were going from about 9 a.m. to 3 a.m. every day. And the real thing that I think, you know, he's always adapted and that allows people to connect with it is it's amazing when someone is truly like trying to serve someone without judgment and integrity and honesty and love. And we often don't get that that often or may withhold that or whatever rules we have around what we need to get in return to have that, but that's always available. And once you're kind of opened up to someone walking the walk and talking the talk, uh, and then you apply it, it really starts to make uh, changes with everyone else around you and yourself. So I think it's really powerful. Everyone should go to one. I think you could watch like his rise summit, which is like his free three day thing on YouTube. If you want to check it out, but always, you know, say those things. And, you know, even if you're into religion or anything, it's like very similar, like that, the actual act of religion is just, practicing empowering emotions like faith gratitude and basically like a higher meaning and stuff so same deal well that's awesome man i i can i can see how that would i mean just being that close to it being that involved and then taking something that you've learned and teaching it i mean you know kind of like with me with trading i've learned so much more about trading because i teach it and i can imagine you you have the same kind of situation from a from that perspective, now that you're coaching and you're teaching and you're, you're that close to it, I'm, I'm sure that's been a huge impact on your life. Yeah. And I mean, that's also kind of like a perfect segue to the trading. So basically the way I like to view the trading as well is there's your ability to recognize a pattern, which is like volatility is overstated, whatever that is. Then you there's your ability to utilize a pattern, which is like seeing some type of signals, being able to read it more in depth. And then there's being able to create some type of pattern, which is like the true innovation. And as we get further along in this and realize vol and implied vol are closer and who knows what's going on in the market making world of zero DT and as technology goes, like technology and everything's moving quicker. And the only people that are going to be able to continue to go with this are going to be, you know, individuals that are able to create their own patterns. And I think this is, you know, always going to be there. And specifically for us as retailers, traders, we're not, you know, tens of billions of dollars of endowments and Wall Street hedge funds. Like the zero DT space is ours because the democratization of information has gotten down to a point where people can, you know, find it and utilize technology for inexpensive cost. But the fact is, like, if you're just throwing around, you know, a couple million bucks, you can still use stops. Uh, within an open market on zero DT, which is something that billion dollar hedge funds can't do. Or if they did, it would be a statistical rounding error on their portfolio. So like, that's why I kind of like to say, focusing on that zero DT space is a great point for retail traders. And then maybe like individual underlyings that are inefficient. And also when I say zero DT, I would like to kind of expand people's mind as well. Because in my opinion, the point of zero DT is you're not carrying anything overnight. And the fact that you can deploy capital five days a week. So whether that be one DT, zero DT, three DT, five DT, or seven DT, I kind of all consider that zero DT trading when I refer to it uh, going forward as well. Gotcha. And so I don't want to make any assumptions, but I assume you're a, you're a net seller of zero DT, right? I mean, you're not you're not buying options. Uh, so I do buyer. buy. Uh, yeah, net. Net, I'm always a seller. I will basically have some neutral delta on some positions I have. However, I'm closer in expiration on my shorts. So as you know, at the time I open the trade, I may be you know neutral or slightly long delta. But once that trade progresses, it's going to be you know short delta very quickly after it's put on. And how are you deciding on the positions that you're taking? Is it strictly uh, volatility measures? Is it back testing? A combination of the 
to, or kind of what's a, give us a high level overview of how you're navigating that zero DTE space. So I look at it a few ways. So first of all is I view it as a portfolio. So it's how trades go in with one another and how that basically affects my ability to profit. And then in regards to that, everything I do is back tested. I never do anything that's not mechanical. However, everything I trade is also based on some type of signal. So I think there's like a stark line between what people would call trend following and what people would basically call like signals. So trend following would just be like, you know, if it's if it's up, I sell puts and it's not really based on some type of back test. But if it's like we're up 1% this day and I sell something like that is what I would consider a signal. And I think a lot of people are also misguided kind of in the tranching community that will do like a dollar each side 12 times during the day and think that's diversification. And it's like, sure, you are a little diversified, but you're going to be less diversified as volatility decreases. And also all of those positions are exposed to potentially one, you know, convex move during the day. But when I'm building my portfolio, I like to look at several things. My three main guiding lights are going to be the MAR, which is the percent return versus the drawdown. And I like to use that as a proxy for capital efficiency and a proxy for risk reward. Then I look at premium capture ratio, which I use as basically a proxy for how robust that edge is. So if there's something with a five to 10% PCR, that edge, in my opinion, could easily erode away. Whereas if you have something with a 30 to 40% PCR, 25% PCR, that edge is most likely not gonna erode away. And then the third metric I use is basically days between new net like highs. Because if I'm trading something, you know, I want to get rewarded for it in a relatively short time frame. The longest I would ever go is basically 90 days. And I think those are kind of like the best metrics you could use because I haven't found one that it has all three, but it seems like they each complement one another. Whereas something with a super good risk reward that is super capital efficient, probably, you know, doesn't have the highest PCR and has quite a few days between new net like highs. And then something with a really high PCR may have a high MAR, but it's going to be very, a lot of days between new net like highs. And then something that has a really low premium capture probably has a massive MAR and a mass and not very many days between new net like highs, but it has a low PCR. And then when I look at that within a portfolio, I'm running everything through Python. It's all empirically based with math and all of that, those things. And all of my sizing is kind of a mix between systemic and selective. And then I also like to play up and down the probability curve. So I have trades that are 95% success, 90% success, 80% success, 70%, 60%, 50%, and then hedges. And by doing that, you know, the deviation of within, you know, two degrees of statistical certainty for a 50% trade could be 20%. With a 95% trade, it's probably only two to 3%. And the thing with zero DTE is the reason I'm able to you know, basically 10% every quarter on that straight 45 degree P&L line is because there's so many occurrences that you're going to get your return and you're going to get your drawdown. And that's within two standard deviation certainty. And you're honestly probably eventually going to get to a three standard deviation probability, but I'm not necessarily as, wor as worried with that. And that's why I buy hedges. And so, so you always, so talk, talk a little bit more about the hedging so you're you're always hedging your positions or you just or when you say hedge are you talking about utilizing different positions yeah. that kind of so, uncorrelated or how, how do you think about that what what i like to do is i'm always managing my short leg on any trade i do just because i think it's more efficient on if there were to be a large move you're going to get filled on a one leg order before you get filled on a two leg order and just fun fact out there, anyone who's not as familiar with how order flow works. So basically through the OCC, you're just in line. So if someone puts a stop on, that's the same like double bid trigger at 9.32 AM and you put yours on at 10.30 or you adjust your stop, you're now behind them in line. But if you're on a mid price, you're ahead of the person that put their order in at 9.32. So lowest level of hedging is that by only managing the shorts, I think you'll get a better fill. You'll be in front of people in line and then your long leg can offset some of those losses if there's a super high convex move. I basically look at the long leg as a way to buffer any slippage on a fast move. So like if you had a dollar slippage, you should probably be able to get a dollar for your long leg outside of like the last half hour power hour. 
And then what I do as well is I'll basically hold hedges anywhere from long options. That'll be from three to 14 days to expiration. And those, like if there's a big drop overnight, I'm kind of already sitting on some potential wins. Or if there's a very hard trending move, like throughout the course of one or two days, I'm basically sitting on profit. So what I like to do is find something that has at least a 25% um, win percent. And that basically has a one mar and a break even expectancy. And those tend to cancel out pretty well with zero day trades because if the market's not moving much, those hedges will basically, you know, be offset by the faster decaying zero DT premium. And then if there were to be some massive trending market, I'm basically getting a bonus on holding those long options. So I don't have to sell, you know, 10% of my account in uh premium to have a 1% up day when S and P is up 1% or something. So I think those are very important to do. I do carry some risk overnight on the short side as well, but that's when I talk about kind of like the net Delta. So that balancing of the two is very important. And one example I'll kind of give that will drill down the fact that options are basically overstated is if you've heard of the concept of like kurtosis, it's basically saying that there's like far more moves within zero to half standard deviations than stated. And then there's fat tails, which there's far more moves that are larger in two standard deviations of magnitude. So by selling, you know, half standard deviation or one standard deviation options, you should be able to profit from the short side. But when it does move, those long options will help that. And an easy way to illustrate that is like if you sell, you know, one day or seven day straddle, you buy it and then you sell like anywhere from 15 to five Delta wings. It basically has a positive expectancy, which empirically you're like, how does this make sense? You know, you're, you, you're defined risk, you're short one, you're long the other. And that's just basically an illustration of how robust that edge is. The question is, how are you going to capture it and be efficient? So you're, so you're, so you're utilizing a little bit of short premium to offset the decay primarily overnight because during yeah. the day you're you're in your positions but and so you're you're using some longer dated options buying far out of the money to hedge yep and you're just using the short premium in a narrower range to offset that decay to equalize it as kind of a net net zero on that on that position unless you have a big move then you benefit is that yeah correct. so the way to think of it is like basically think of it as a sharp buffer so like by having this hedge um at a longer duration like the fade is faster on the shorts because they're shorter duration is even though those hedges basically have a break-even expectancy it increases the sharp on your portfolio so your risk to reward is just improved by holding those hedges because when you get hurt on a big move those are basically going to pay off um on another way and that is also, so like we talk about systemic and selective strategies and the curve fitters are selective. I believe that the only truly robust trade over an extremely long period of time that you can be systemic trading in every day, no matter the environment is something like that, that is based on, you know, an options theory in regards to short, shorter duration as more theta, longer duration as less. And basically like as that decay curve goes off, that'll balance out. And like Ron Bertino has a great course when he speaks about that, you know, in longer durations and how to use portfolio margin to basically, you know, offset the ability that your broker would let you borrow for those more conservative trades because they're less capital efficient. And are those, are those longer dated hedges that you use, are those just something like, and I know it varies and you probably ladder into them or whatever, but are those something that you just, you put on right before the close to hold every night and then you reset them every day? Or is it some, or some of them you're just kind of longer duration, you're just holding over the course yeah, of all, days, all my weeks. hedges are going to be put on at the open or the close just because, you know, I think that's the best, most unexpected time to where it makes sense to like buy vol basically. And then in regards to, the management of them, I also think it's more, and I've back tested this too, it's more efficient to constantly roll them than to hold something. Just like using a certain stop loss on short 
options, there's an inflection point to where that curve basically flattens out that like it's no longer a useful hedge. So all of those intricacies are important ways to understand how you would correctly hedge your portfolio. And it lets you be more capital efficient because it can offset your short options with your zero DT trades. And the other thing that I would really like to emphasize to people is let's say you're selling like a 75 cent option and you're buying a five cent wing. Like you're basically giving up, you know, 10% of your profit to buying that wing. Whereas if you have a long option, that's a hedge completely offsets your buying power. And you just given yourself 10, you know, 10% edge just from that, that also buffers your sharp portfolio. And like Corey Hosting talks about this too, but it's basically called return stacking. So you can margin your treasury hundred percent on TDA. So like get a 5% risk free rate. You can use long options that improve your sharp that offset zero DT trades. And on top of that, there's other products. I highly recommend people checking this out as well. There's a product called like a 3130 from Quantino and basically it holds the index and then with leverage shorts, you know, 30% of the comport components in the index and it'll hold unrealized long gains in the index if the market goes up and it'll realize short term losses from short selling of the components that are below the EMA. It's all by computer. So you're basically tax off harvesting on the way up or down with still getting the eight to 10% return from the S&P. So it's like, we're just adding risk-free rates, tax efficiencies and all of those things. And I kind of like to relate those and even in options, I call them tractor supply companies and towns that are too small for Walmart. It's like, there's niches that we can take massive advantages of either from laws and regulation, from lobbying from the financial space, or just from our size that we can use stop losses and you know zero DT and stuff. So that's free money. And everyone should be taking advantage of that once you get to size. And it makes a massive difference because you're compounding this 256 days a year. And the example that I like to give is if you make 48% a year, you make 4% a month. But if you make 4% a month, which is what zero DT options you know, could potentially do, 4% a month compounded to 61% a year. So just showing up and trading zero DT doing this, taking the same amount of risk as everyone else. And it's actually less because you're not holding overnight risk. You're getting a 25% boost year one. You know what I'm saying? And that's going to be convex and basically be a two X boost year two. And that's the predominant pattern of zero DT and trading. And you can pick your route with options that whichever way the market's going, you can still profit. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, well said. I mean, you, you really articulated that well too. That's, that's great. You said you said one thing I want to I want to circle back on. You said a lot of your zero DTE or all of your zero DTE positions are based on a specific setup. Mm -hmm. When you say that, are you always going in delta neutral or are you doing directional zero DTE trades as well? So I've got a few ways to go about it. I also don't think delta is the best proxy. And again, we go back to patterns. So like if I trade a dollar option on each side and on and I make them 50 wide. On my put side, I'm buying a 10 cent wing. On my call side, I'm buying a five cent wing. So like the volatility risk premium is already off. And then on top of that, there's more skew on the downside. And when I say skew, the way I like to relate this is the most accurate pricer of moves within the market, which is shown to be overstated, is the at the money implied volatility. And this is not the VIX, that's the strike of the at the money implied volatility. And there's basically no difference between the put side and the call side. And then further out of the money options have more um, of an implied volatility at that strike. And then on the call side, it kind of has a smile to where it's basically the same as at the money options. So if you were to sell those, you know, $2 or $1 on each side, and the strike for the put side is an 18% implied volatility, and the strike on the call side is a 16%, implied volatility, you're not actually delta neutral. So I'm basically always leaning to the put side. I'm having more, whether that be I have four puts, two calls, I sell an extra dollar on the put side. And then the puts for the same premium is usually also further out of the money. So as the trade ages, that basically becomes a different aspect. But in regards to the signals and how I like to look at them is Different market environments provide different opportunities. And unless they're married with a long option, there's going to be problems with that. So if we have a 15 VIX, there's less implied volatility and there's less skew than there is when there's 20 VIX. And in regards to that, there's also less premium and 
there's less options later in the day. So with the 20 VIX, we have six and a half hours to take viable trades. With a 15 VIX, we may only have three hours. So that is the you know predominant proxy for it. And that varies a little bit. The 85% of the Apple money straddle based on data is the most accurate for zero DT, but we can basically blank at that. And I view there's three times for trade opportunities that I look at. That's the open, that's basically the Euro close or the lunch. And then there's power hour, which are hedging obligations. So when I'm breaking down these trades initially to start at the open, I basically know that like this is the most uncertain predictor of volatility during the day. I basically have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm almost always delta neutral, obviously usually leaning towards the put side. And also the big handicap of stuff at the open and the big reward of the open is if you take it all the way to expiration and the market doesn't move, it pays very well, but you're exposed to that market move basically the entire day. So I like to pair both of those types of strategies. And once I go and look into it, I'm going to base like what are signals that do that well. So a simplest signal is I like to talk about the Monday and Wednesday effect. I don't believe the Thursday effect. I'm not a curve fitter, but for example, today, I don't know what the sad is. Don't quote it on me, but it was in like you and Sinclair's book. It's like 95% of VIX options expire out of the month. So today we open up, ball came out from, you know, Tuesday CPI and 15 strike VIX has the most open interest. So like I know like, sure, we could ping pong up and down, but like, we're probably not going to have a sell off today being Wednesday at the open. So like, I'm already comfortable with leaning towards the put side. And if the market trends slightly down, I'll probably add more to that put side. And when we talk about the signals, I have to also explain it. So I can make sense why Wednesday works. I can't make sense why Thursday doesn't work other than like it's 20% of the week. And there are probably some really bad days just from volatility or news events because volatility and pricing in isolation is very valuable and easy to take an edge of. But the second there's actual market movement from some type of news announcement, I'll just throw out basically all my signals. And then also the way options are priced, it's like going to the upside, it's much easier to hedge. And it's also much easier to make money because people normally, you know, sell calls and then they buy them back. Whereas on the put side, people roll down their puts and then there's that volatility feedback loop, which is like volatility spikes up, dealers need to sell more futures to hedge, which causes the market to go down and then it moves down faster and pricing expands rapidly. Where on the upside, you know, dealers are short selling their hedges that were long and it's basically compressing that movement slightly. So once I establish that aspect of just knowing about options in general, I'm then looking at indicators. So EMA is not a great indicator just because I don't think it's robust because price can, you know, slightly move for like two minutes and screw you up. Whereas percent up or, you know, how much the VIX moved overnight, especially if that was from a news event, is a is a pretty good proxy for the signals that I like to choose from. And I think, you know, we've seen some of that in the community. And then you then establish guardrails on that. So like we know our theory, we're back testing it, we know what we're looking for. And then we kind of a set guardrails. So like if the market is up 1%, selling any type of put will work. If the market's up half a percent, like you probably actually want to put a cap on, you know, potentially selling some call stuff, maybe at like one and a half percent or the VIX is down, whatever, because we could still be ripping up to that. Whereas like Another thing I like to say too is like to the downside, I'll usually just, that's a signal just not to trade because vol's going crazy, pricing is all weird, like slippage is usually worse, liquidity is worse. So to the downside, I predominantly don't use very many signals unless it's middle of the road downside. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, we can we can talk a little bit about your hedge fund and, and whatever you are comfortable with talking about. We can, or, or, you know, if, if there's something you'd prefer not to discuss, that's, that's cool too, but really this could go either your personal side or the hedge fund. You mentioned utilizing Python and, uh, you know, the, uh, some, some automated programs that you use is everything that you do automated with zero DTE, or do you also manually use discretion in certain environments? Um, I will use discretion for taking off hedges. Uh, and I predominantly do that because I'll kind of marry it to a short strike. 
I'm not too concerned with that. And also monetizing hedges since it doesn't happen as often, who knows what's going on is more of an art than a science. And everything I'm doing is automated just because I think that 80% of people's mistakes is their psychology. So the less you could be in front of a computer, the better. Like that's just, uh, again, that's free lunch that you can basically just pick up in regards to that. And the way I kind of like to look at, you know, how I'm going to manage that or with Python, also with Python, it's like, there's a plugin to Excel Microsoft 365. So I don't know how to really type Python. I could just use the plugin for Excel. So that buried entry again, again, is basically gone if you're willing to spend three hours to learn Excel. Um, but that's a roadmap on what is applicable. And it's honestly not even the most accurate thing on earth. Cause like I've run optimal sharp on Python and then I've just sized stuff manually. And all these programs basically have assumptions like sharp is assuming everything is basically, I think it won the Nobel prize. Everything is basically just a stock. It can only go up and down. You know, they're all just as capital efficient for one another. And that's obviously not true. And that mistake is amplified. And that assumption is amplified by 250 trading days a year. So understanding all that as a guardrail and then being able to apply, you know, a worst case scenario is a very important aspect when you're sizing all that stuff. Gotcha. And so are you, are you trading your own personal stuff on the side or are your funds inside the hedge fund? How do you, how do you kind of manage that whole difference? Yeah. So I am within the hedge fund. I do have about 25% of the fund is my capital. Uh, and then on the side, I'm actually doing what I call the 401% of my 401k. I may blow it up, but I basically have like a 200 grand 401k on the side. And my goal is to make 401% on it this year through trading zero DT. And the reason I, like I do that, that I is like because, that. yeah, a lot of people have a misnomer with, oh, options are risky or people just love volatile stocks. Like, you know, because most people just throw a dart at the wall and one out of a thousand buys an NVIDIA call at the low and they make 10 million bucks. And that's how most people make money with options or they just buy a really volatile asset like Bitcoin. And there's going to be an even distribution of people that make insane amounts of money and people that basically lose money. Whereas what I'm trying to say is, you know, like I said, made money in 17 consecutive quarters. I've done at least 10%. And that's just because that's that 45 degree line and based on math. However, I like if you're okay with a 50% drawdown, like volatile assets, you know, not to pick on Bitcoin, it's just what's coming to my mind. You could do 400% and have a better risk adjusted reward. And I could tell you I could make 400% if you're okay with a 50% drawdown too. Obviously, don't do that in the fund. I have a low volatility target and stuff. Uh, but that is the real aspect of mastery that I like to point out to people is that, you know, it's really riding your own path and people often don't understand the risk that they're taking for the reward, especially when we're in a bull market or the government's dumping money into the economy. No one knows who's swimming with their shorts off until that rolls over, which is just a much longer time frame than, you know, zero DT stuff, which like I said, you're going to get to that one or two standard deviation with like 90 days. So I met someone, you know, on discord in the trading community that was basically like, look at this amazing indicator on puts. And this is, been since like the Gaza thing in October. And I was like, I could use the indicator that in, you know, Idaho on a day when it's visibility is more than seven miles and it would look like the best trade on earth. You know what I'm saying? So that's really where I like to push back on that stuff. But I also want to show the power of these zero DT options. It's like, just from a personal story, it's like, I'm, you know, I made no money trading zero DT. I made 10 grand trading zero DT. I made a hundred grand trading zero DT. I made a million trading zero DT. I'm trying to make 10 million this year, zero DT. And like, just by doing that, like that scale actually goes on in perpetuity. Once you have that mastery and not saying that it's easy or everyone could do it, but that type of consistency really is there in all the opportunities kind of within those tractor supply companies that, 
in towns that are too small for Walmarts. So that's how I like to view it is like we use empirical math, like Python, fancy Wall Street stuff. And I'm getting more into like this quant stuff and uh, networking people. Then we just use our general common sense. And then we use backtesting. And by having a mix of all those fours, you can create a very profitable search for basically what you're going to do, make this money machine. Gotcha. And so obviously with your personal account, you're, you're, you're leveraging that you're, you're shooting yeah. for big returns. What's, what's kind of the goal of your hedge fund from a volatility um, and performance standpoint? Personally, I think that a six to one mar minimum 10% PCR. And then I like to, I'm saying, you know, kind of a 40% target just because depending on the VIX, I'm doing Delta base trades which that can vary. So I could basically hit that all the time and then targeting around a, a 5% max drawdown. So those are basically the predominant returns in that. And my other thing, like real return with funds, like I'd love to basically empower people to have financial freedom. Because if you can make 40% a year, if you put a hundred grand in something that compounds with 40% a year, four years later, you're going to be getting a hundred grand in income from it with that type of compounding. And that is a massive life changer for people. Whereas I feel like there's a lack of integrity in most of the financial spaces. It's like you ask your financial advisor when the market's down, like, what should I do? They say, oh, you know, in the long run, in 30 years, this happens. It's like, well, if you make 8% a year in, you know, your account and inflation's 5% over 10 years, especially after taxes, your purchasing power didn't change. And now you're up creek with no paddle. Whereas like, I'm like, oh, you'll get 10% in 90 days. You'll at least know if you're full of shit, if I'm full of shit and you're on the path within, you know, three months. And like, but you could also basically have that freedom within four years. So I think that is the huge disclaimer of all that. And the other thing too is I think everyone should basically be like giving their money, you know, like I tithe 10% of basically everything I make within the fund and personally. Like, first thing I give is basically to like stop child sex trafficking and stuff. And I think a lot of people should empower that because it's like if the government asked you, hey, we're raising taxes by 10%, like you'd bitch, you'd moan, but you'd pay it. And then kind of by leaving that scarcity of tying it to something else or like helping these other people and doing it with like your integrity, your caring, your kindness and being upfront of what that is. That's what I really want to bring to the financial space and this democratization of information and ability to have all of these rules and regulations that these massive billion dollar Wall Street firms lobbied, they're available to the common man now. And there's a bunch of great ways out there. You can harness it even through different assets other than a zero DT hedge fund. Alto will let you take your 401k from a prior employer. You could invest in private equity. You could invest in, you know, people's life insurance policies that'll never go up and down. And by having all of this ability out there and this getting monetized to smaller and smaller parties, there's an absolute financial revolution that was lit off by 2020, but everyone I think is still just focused on the shiny objects of what's the next NVIDIA, what's the next chip stock, what's the next GameStop. Whereas if you can compound money at 20% a year and you can save 20% of your income, no one should be working till after they're 40, you know? And like, I'm proof of this. Like I was a construction worker making 60 grand a year and now, you know, I'm a hedge fund manager making over 10 times that. It didn't take that long. It's not, I'm not saying it was easy, but there's a bunch of aspects of that where you could have other people look after your money. And like the biggest example I give is if Apple sells a million iPhones and hits their, you know, earnings report, the market votes that up and down what that multiple is. They could say, we can't get this, interest rates go up, and you're participating in this voting mechanism. However, if you were invested in, some private equity firm, you know, as a limited partner, you're not doing anything, but some accountant comes in and they say, okay, everyone hit their earnings in your um, portfolio. We assign a 5X multiple of this. And irregardless of what interest rates are, what's going on in the economy, that's not voted up and down. And the thing is like that can suck because you, you don't go up 300% like NVIDIA in a year, but that massive compounding is hugely beneficial. And then if you could take off 20% of your taxes, on top of that, which is your largest expense in life, now you're actually on the path to wealth. And that's my big thing with this whole navigation thing and other trading communities and whatever that is. It's like, you, 
it's not trading options. It's everything else around it that'll actually get you there. And it's that skill that's going to age in all regards of it. And basically, like I tell people is your goal should just be to get 20 grand a month notional, you know, which is dollars, not necessarily a percent return that can vary for people. And once you're there, you're cooking the breeze. And now you're really on that starting to be, you know, curve of getting your way to financial freedom. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. There, there's, there's so many just life skills that come out of learning to trade options. You know, you're learning to take risk. You're learning to manage risk. You're learning to think in probabilities. It makes you a, a faster decision maker in everything you do, right? Because, you know, as traders, we're like, here we go. We got to make a decision, right? There's, yeah. you know, there's, you know, sometimes you don't have time to ponder things if you're, especially if you're trading zero DTE. So, I, I love that. I love that conversation because I think it's so powerful. It's not just about making money trading options. There are so many more benefits that that bleed into other areas of your life. That's just uh, priceless. Um, yeah. Going back, going back to one thing you said. So we we didn't hit it, hit on this at the beginning, and I wanted to talk a little bit about it. But dude, how do you, how do you go from a construction worker to to trading? Like what? Where was the bridge there? What what happened? Uh, so like I'd always been interested in investing. So right when I got out of college, I was commuting a huge amount in the Bay Area. I was doing like three hours a day. So I was listening to stuff, um, podcasts, whatever, on my way home. And my dad had, you know, been trading options since the 80s when they were listed in the newspaper. So I was always familiar to basically what options is. But I tried the Warren Buffett thing, you know, everything is just correlated to the SPX and like M2. So it doesn't matter. Uh, it's too you know, slow. That's just, like yeah, you really want to save slow. for 40 years? <laughs> yeah. And then I had originally gotten into basically tractor supply companies and things that are too small for Walmart with real estate. So I'd gotten into like bigger pockets. I was making a big salary in the Bay Area, living in a really small spot and saving up a bunch of money. And I basically could buy quadplexes with traditional loan terms and you could use the rent to basically get more debt. And there wasn't competition from anyone big because they're competing with government finance debts to individuals and people with kids don't like living in quadplexes as their first home because it's not the most inviting place and it doesn't look very good. So basically what I would do is I would buy quadplexes in the nicest possible area code that were just bad, like terrible. And I'd use a bunch of debt to finance them through the government. And then I would rent them out to section eight tenants, which are like all great people. They need somewhere to live. They have a housing voucher. They're great tenants and like eviction rules are different. And they'll basically pay you 15% of them above market rent in that area. code. So basically by doing no value add, I could go from making four grand a month in rent to making seven grand a month in rent just from that, you know, conglomeration of it. So I did that for a while. And then I was like, real estate's it. I bought two properties. I was like dabbling in options a little bit. I was running, you know, a very involved 90 day gold, oil, TLT, SPX, Q's, like profit take hedge thing. And then I was going to get my refi out in like 2021 from my low interest rate home that boomed. And I couldn't get this refi out basically from the home because I was living in San Francisco with roommates and the way the government looks at it, even though I had four roommates, I was paying 12 grand a month for rent basically. So I couldn't get any money out of that. And I'd like told my uh, boss, I was like, Hey, I'm moving to Texas. I'm going to start trading. I had gotten a job offer to basically sell like commercial real estate as a consultant with a biotech firm for like 250 grand. And I was like, no, I am trading options. Russia invades Ukraine. My account tanks, I lose like, you know, 25% of that account from just ball going up. And that one day when they took over the power plant is really what killed me. I couldn't get my refi out. While that happens, I had bed bugs in like one of the apartment complexes. It was so dirty. I couldn't even insure it. It spread everywhere. All my tenants left. My entire life savings wiped out to fix up these apartment complexes the money I had saved all went into that. I couldn't get my refi. My dad was getting sick during all this. I made a mistake at work that may or may not have been a fireball offense, but I told him I was you know, already leaving. Then I got fired and couldn't get unemployment and was stuck with San Francisco rent. And basically went from like thinking I'd have a million dollars 
to being 40 grand in credit card debt while this is happening as my uh, dad had like some health problems too. That was obviously hard, but at that point is when I really decided like, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow through. And this is all during the Tony Robbins thing. And I basically grinded out, not doing that well, like all of you in there um, that may be new to trading options. And I started to get more, more momentum. I wasn't necessarily, you know, I talked about this, like it's a good thing. I wasn't a very happy person during that time. Um, and I basically got like a new remote, you know, intro levy level sales job in tech as all this happens, making like 60 grand a year. And I basically just worked all the time, worked through that, got momentum, was able to sell these properties. And that's basically, you know, the story of how I went from making 62 grand a million dollars in a year. Obviously my account like 30 X when I got, you know, apartment complexes worth of equity out during sale and was able to trade them. But the thing is, it's like having the enjoyment and the passion and the belief in yourself that it wasn't the money. It was proving to yourself and instilling that certainty in yourself that you're able to do something like, like that, you know what I'm saying? And not giving up at that first notion or whatever. And it's like, I'm super glad that happy because I probably would have been really cocky and like living in Miami, you know, doing something that I wouldn't be proud of now if it was that easy. So I really kind of look at that as the gift of all of it and going through that, like putting your ass out on the line in business or a relationship or with friends or like there's some type of struggle in your life. Like that's really what you can hang your hat on as a person. It's going to be a part of you. It's just all about giving a, a more empowering meaning to it. And then it's like, you can show up for people indefinitely better going in the future and you just walk different and you can notice that when you talk to other people in life now and that's basically like the path i'm on now and i've kind of focused like even though i'm in the zeros and money business i'm not going to pretend like making a bunch of money for myself or other people actually makes a difference it's what you're doing with that and making an intent for it as well and helping people that like frankly, I kind of vet people that I may talk to the fund. It's like, I don't, I don't really care if you just have money. It's like, I want to make sure like you're actually trying to do something with it. Or like you got some type of compelling future that you, you want to use this for, you know what I'm saying? Wow. That's, that's a power. That's such a powerful story, man. That yeah. I had, when I, when we spoke before, I had, I had no idea of that whole uh, situation that happened, but man, and, and, and so, I mean, just based on your, depth of knowledge of how you're trading and, and the sophistication of what you're doing versus what a lot of people are doing. And you've only been really digging into this for three or four years, right. On the zero DT yeah. stuff. That's yeah. pretty amazing. I mean, I mean, that's, yeah. that's really amazing. I mean, it, it like, just shows how committed you, you have really been for those few years. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, it's all about tying it to something else, but all the information's there. And like, I read a lot of literature that wasn't really applicable to trading zero DT, but it paid off in theory further down the road. And I think a lot of people overestimate what they can do in a year or a month and underestimate what they could do in a decade. So that's, that's saying, kind yeah. of, yeah. That's and, a Tony Robbins saying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, yeah. I'm pulling quotes out uh, here. Left yeah, and, no, left I, right. I've heard that before. And I, I couldn't remember if that was him. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Or the other one I like too, and this is in general, it's like, you can, uh, you know, you can fight for your limitations and keep them, or you can, you know, fight for your possibilities and create them. So like you, you choose, you know what I'm saying? That's awesome. Well, Mark, I really appreciate your time. I mean, I, I think so many people will really resonate or, or, you know, find value from your story and just for, from the knowledge that you've shared. So I've, I really appreciate you coming on. Now you have your own podcast. Is that correct? Is that started or is that about to start? Yeah. Um, so I'm recording stuff. I think it's going to start with being more applicable to just people trading um, in general. So I'm building out my brand and presence and, you know, all things zero DT to be the predominant, um, zero DT guys. So that's all going to be coming down the gambit here. Um, if you, you know, follow me on LinkedIn or, you know, I'm going to have a more organized website here pretty soon to where you can sign up for newsletters and everything. But I'm, I aspire to put out, uh, the mountain quality and, uh, integrity of your guys' information. And that'll be coming out the gambit here. But if anyone wants to chat with me, like I just love chatting options or things in general. So if you go to my website at MBH capital management, you can just 
schedule a call to just chat or whatever. I'm always happy to basically like look through someone's um, back testing or portfolio they're running and give you my time for free. Um, I just like one-on-one -on -one personal uh, things like this basically. So, so MBH capital yep. management is your, is your company. And what's the name of your podcast going to be? Uh, it's just be all about zero DT options with Mark Anderson. So that's just what that's it's awesome. going to be about. 30 and then if you are in the uh, navigation trading community, his profile is just Mark Anderson. So you can find him there. So, man, we appreciate, I, I appreciate you having you as, as part of our community. You know, I just, I love connecting with smart people who are passionate about, I mean, not only trading, but, you know, I mean, your passion shows through on, you know, kind of wanting to, you know, just make this world a better place. I love that. So thank you so much for your time, Mark. I appreciate you coming on and uh, I'd like to do it again. Of course, Steve, I'll talk to you later. Appreciate it so much. Sounds good.